Good evening, good afternoon. Hello world, as we used to say at the beginning of the internet. I'm going to start by reading a short passage from Woody Holton's Unruly Americans. This is a book that has gotten mentioned a great deal on my YouTube channel lately, and it is a book that I've quoted in writing my own strange volume. I'm writing a book right now that is titled No More Manifestos. I would just mention the discussion of the history and present political implications of the American Constitution has got to be the least popular topic on my YouTube channel. And I don't get it. If you look at the videos I have discussing Woody Holton's book, and I did several close succession because I've been doing so much reading and research lately about the American Constitution, uh, they get fewer views than my discussion of the politics of Belarus, the politics of Chile, the politics of China, out in Xinjiang and so on, right? Like I've, I've covered some pretty obscure political topics on my channel. And uh, it's strange to me, you know, the American constitution influenced the writing of basically every other constitution in the world as it now exists. It influenced the writing of the Japanese constitution and of communist China's constitution and so on. It is not, you know, it is not purely an American affair uh, by any means. And, you know, uh, obviously, it seems to me 2021 is a year when there ought to be especially profound um, introspection about uh, the American Constitution. And, you know, as I keep saying, what next? What now? Now, I'll, I'll just, uh, before reading this passage, I'll mention, you know, I have had some email back and forth with uh, Professor Woody Holton. I very much appreciate his uh, taking the time. But that also, I mean, I, I feel a certain uh, connection to and fondness for the book. If you look him up on YouTube, you'll get to hear him stating his opinion, although most of the YouTube videos are fully 10 years old. Uh, one of the main sentiments I expressed to him in correspondence is this, in case you haven't picked this up from my, my YouTube videos dealing with these issues, either directly or tangentially. You know, it's really false to assume that the elite are wrong about something just because they are the elite. And it is wrong to assume that the poor and the oppressed are correct about something in politics just because they are uh, poor and oppressed. Now, I also know there's a riddle here that the very best anthropologists are familiar with. Unfortunately, I can't say, as any good anthropologist would know, anthropology is a field in a, in par a parlous condition, 21st century. Parlous, parlous. Uh, but, you know, if I, were, if I were to talk to you about the politics of Thailand, and I said to you, well, you know, in Thailand, there is this small American-educated economic elite. There are these people who are wealthy, and they own the shopping malls, and they partly got inspired by going to America and seeing what American shopping malls are. Thailand has much better shopping malls than the United States of America. I am not a shopping mall aficionado. I'm, I'm a politics aficionado. But still, you know, if you were to say, well, there is this kind of pro-democracy uh, American educated and culturally Americanized elite in Thailand. And here's their agenda. Here's what they want um, in the current debates in Thailand about how they're going to rewrite the constitution. How many constitutions have been written in Thailand during my lifetime? <laughs> in which they are more or less constantly uh, drafting a new constitution in Thailand because it's happened again and again and again. Nobody in this audience would suppose, oh, well, these must be terrible people. The people whose opinion about politics matters are the poor and downtrodden farmers. It must be that we get out to the rice paddies. It must be that we get out and talk to the most illiterate, most backward people in the remote hinterland. We have to ask them what the constitution should be and what the future of the country, you know, uh, politically should be. They must be the benighted, uh, <laughs> benighted in every sense of the word. <laughs> you know, they must be the people gifted with some kind of uh, benevolent attitude and profound insight about how politics and country ought to work. Now, given that we would not see the politics of Thailand this way, given that we certainly would not see the politics of Afghanistan this way, or Iran. When you look at Iran, we seem to only care about the western half of 1% of the population. Those are the people we think have enlightened attitudes about what the past, present, and future of Iran ought to be. Why, when we look at our own uh, history, we have this very peculiar anti-elitist bias. Well, I'm just going to, you know my, you know my steez, I keep it all the way real. This is something I had to grow out of myself. You know, I think it's, <laughs> I'm Canadian. I utterly despise elite Canadian culture. I have, I have no respect whatsoever for someone who was born the child of wealthy landlord parents in Toronto. Like their parents own apartment buildings and collect their rent from those apartment buildings. And they went through uh, one of our elite law schools 
uh, you know, in downtown Toronto and then you know, served a role at Queens Park. And so I have absolutely no respect for those people. Uh, I even I even have some very active disrespect for those people. And, you know, although Canada is not a hotbed of rebellion, I think the vast majority of people feel the same way I do. There is, a, you know, this is also I mean, frankly, this is one of the characteristics, I would say, of, of the majority of American culture, Democrat or Republican. It's so widespread that people don't question it. Sort of healthy contempt for elites, you know, characterizes all of American culture. It's very different from British culture, you know that someone within a refined accent and elite education representing the city, representing London, England, that an elite barrister in London has some kind of social status and, and respect and so on. Uh, you know, that um, I, in American society, I, mean, I, I really think that's fair to say, you know, whether you're talking about the state of Michigan or the state of Texas, I think there is a kind of healthy contempt for people from elite backgrounds where it's like, well, you know, maybe you have something to teach me. Maybe you know something I don't, but you haven't proved it yet. Let's see what you're made of. Um, now, I'm, mm -hmm, there are doubtless, you know, disadvantages to this, this attitude also. But anyway, I have to say, growing up in the culture that I did in Canada, having no respect for the elite, no respect for my own teachers who were terrible people, no respect for my professors who were with almost no exceptions, terrible people, you know, um, having nobody to look up to in this uh, particular society, which evolved in the shadow of slavery and genocide, and my generation could never forget it. You know, I, having grown up in the shadow of the Anglican church that nobody believes in. I mean, if you think Catholicism was discredited in my generation, talk about British Anglicanism, the status of the Anglican church in Canada or in England, so it's, it, it's, you know, level of esteem has fallen much, much lower. So you have... Um, a very different relationship between the, the social strata than what you have, for example, in communist China, let alone, uh, let alone England. So you have this to begin with. It certainly was a habit of mind I had as a young man, both in looking at Canadian politics and when I was first getting involved in the politics of Thailand, the politics of Cambodia, the politics of Laos and so on, that you would look at this situation with the assumption that the people at the periphery, whether that's literally and geographically the rural periphery, the farmers living in poverty on the cusp, or people who were just uh, part of the downtrodden poor, that somehow those are the people whose political opinion matters. And whatever it was that was being said by the elite must reflect some kind of self-interested conspiracy that ought to be uh, rebuffed or scoffed at as, you know, a mere, mere self-serving nonsense. So, you know, th there's a certain bias and, uh, okay, in some other context, I might say that this were a stereotypically left-wing bias. How typical it is right now of the, the right wing. The whole Donald Trump rested on the shoulders of, you know, a generation of Americans, some just poor rednecks who were willing to say, who were willing to presume that everything said on the news was some kind of, you know, tissue of lies, that everything, everything said by a, an authority figure, whether it be a university professor, or, you know, an elite educational establishment, uh, elites connected to uh, practice of medical science, you know, uh, elites uh, explicitly or implicitly connected to the, the political structure of life. This scoffing at elite figures and presuming they have their own self-interested reasons to say whatever they say, that they're, they're only saying something because it's going to make more money for a corporation like Pfizer or Moderna, you know, that they, they represent big pharma. That runs really deep in the 21st century, both on the left and on the right. So anyway, this is a digression and yet very much to the point. When I wrote to uh, Professor Woody Holton, the main thing I said to him was, apart from giving him the link to my video, which he watched, I'm glad he found the time to watch it. The main thing I said to him was, look, we really make a profound error in judgment when we presume that the elite are wrong just because they're elite, or we presume that the poor are right just because they are poor, or just because they are the oppressed. You know, I think we all have a sense that you ought to make a special effort to listen to the voices of the oppressed because they're oppressed. Because if you don't listen, if you don't make that effort, they're not going to have this kind of institutional force and broadcasting behind them. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> you know, uh, they can be 110% wrong. And he replied to me, I, I'm not going to disclose the details of anyone's private correspondence, but he did reply to me thoughtfully and saying, well, you know, now in 2021, after the events of January 6, 2021 happened, we all have to really, you know, as I had said, we all have to kind of re-examine our positive bias 
in favor of poor and uneducated farmers. So, I mean, I'm guessing that in the social circles he moves in, uh, where, I mean, okay, if you were a career, if you were a career university professor in the United States of America, how much time do you spend with farmers? <laughs> how much time do you spend talking politics with high school dropouts? How often do you meet someone who unironically goes to church? You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole range of uh, political perspectives that you may be willingly or unwillingly, you know, blind to. Those are not the people you meet. That's not the people you listen to. So, hey, guys, um, I just see some questions from the audience. Uh, what Totally reasonable question. Here, Melissa, you'll like this. Eisel, what do you make of the whole situation with the Uyghurs in concentration camps in China? And someone has said, oh, uh, Google Xinjiang on his channel and you'll get some videos. So, yes, I have made several videos about that. And we have the world's most slow-moving research project on it, which is discussed in an earlier live stream. We have a stack of books here we we're going to present. But, yes, you will find that I have my own uh, shockingly unique and original perspective on that that rather challenges uh, what the mainstream media has been chewing on for the past uh, several years. Um, speaking of speaking of reviling the mainstream media is nothing but a, nothing but a tissue of lies. Look, the reality is you can't be an expert in everything. I didn't say anything about this in the last video. Um, I remember the first time I met a young woman with a master's degree who had just returned from Xinjiang. She might have not yet received her master's, but she was doing her MA research in the field in Xinjiang. I heard her give a lecture and I talked to her directly afterwards. That was my first, that was probably the first time I ever really heard of or talked about Xinjiang. That was when I was in Toronto about 2001. Um, that kind of put it in my mind. When I was at Cambridge, England, I spoke to, there's one I really remember speaking to, but maybe there were two researchers connected to Xinjiang. There's one guy I spoke to at length. He'd been living there and learning the language and talking to people and doing, uh, doing research. And then I was physically in China when the Xinjiang stabbing Olympics happened, when there were riots and stabbings in the streets, and I saw the Chinese government response to that zone at that time. So there were many points in my life that, you know, piqued my interest, shall we say. Uh, I would not list it in my top 10 research interests, but it is something I have been interested in reading about for much of my adult life intermittently to say the least when I wasn't studying Cambodia or Laos or uh, history of genocide in Canada, the American constitution, these other things we're talking about. Uh, but the people who work for NBC and ABC and the PBC, most of these, they don't, they don't even have my level of background. With that. So if you want to say that I'm an interested amateur in dealing with Xinjiang and the politics of Western China and Central Asia, nevertheless, if you add up all the hours and you add up the number of brain cells devoted to this, um, you know, you have to recognize most of the people playing this game. They have not put any of that, any of that time or effort. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I seriously suggested to my girlfriend, Melissa, that the two of us could take on a kind of research project in Central Asia. I have sent emails to universities in Central Asia proposing the idea that we actually move there, that we would go and live there for a time. Uh, not Xinjiang itself, that would be politically impossible, but just over the border into those adjacent Central Asian countries. I think at 42, I'm 42 years old now, I think I think it might be too late for me to go out and, and boldly strike out. A new, I, don't, I don't know if I can do again in Xinjiang what I once did in Cambodia, put it that way. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's something I take seriously and, you know, we've, we've talked about taking it seriously. And look, compared to other, well, hey, we were just talking about attitudes towards uh, economic and educational elites. What would be more meaningful if I went and opened a small hotel in Central Asia? Doesn't matter that much. I mean, Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan, but you know, we can say uh, Kyrgyzstan. Not that my pronunciation is great, you know. But if I, for me to go and open and operate a small hotel there and learn Chinese and teach Chinese and and make YouTube videos about politics, or to study and pass the bar here and become a lawyer in Western Canada. What do you think would be a more meaningful use of the next five years of my life? You don't have to answer. We're not gonna have a poll. We're not gonna vote. My, my point is, even if this were a terrible idea, it's better than a lot of other supposedly self-evidently good ideas that people entertain. And you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot while not being, uh, you know, while not being formally enrolled in any uh, educational program. Okay, and in my experience, it's the opposite. It's incredibly hard to find a formal educational program in which you will learn anything at all. Okay, so quoting uh, Woody Holton in Unruly Americans. You'll see why I'm quoting this passage. This is just in the last few pages of the book. Quote, anyone who has broken off a chunk of the past and thoroughly scrutinized it will tell you the same thing. It always turns out that the truth of the matter is hidden under a thick coat of calmness perceptions. 
What is striking about the genesis of the Constitution is that the confusion is not limited to the ill-informed. Indeed, a different set of myths seem to conceal the framers' motives at every level of expertise. Mm, a $100 donation from the peanut gallery. Quote, Hi, Eisel. Got a question for you. Is it worth to promote politics, nihilism, etc., through fiction to young adults? Okay, great question. I'm going to continue reading this passage, and I'll come back and uh, I'll come back and discuss further what your question is about. Just a By the way, it is not 100 U.S. dollars. It's 100 of some foreign currency. I I know not the name of. <laughs> Could be Russian rubles. Don't know. <laughs> but thank you for the donation. I'll uh, I'll just continue reading this. You'll see this book. It doesn't rely on. Uh, doesn't rely on a great deal of, shall, shall we say, rhetorical fireworks, but he has some nice turns of phrase here uh, in the conclusion. Americans who spend the least time thinking about the Constitution often confuse it with either the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights, i.e. these are, in fact, three very different things. They credit the framers with a passionate urge to safeguard civil liberties such as gun rights and freedom of religion and speech. Authors who mention the Constitution in passing, for instance, in, in the biographies of the founders and in school textbooks, avoid that error. They say the dragon the framers were trying to slay was the weakness of the federal government under the Articles of Confederation. That view is not wrong, but we will never fully understand why the Constitutional Convention was held until we grasp the full implications of James Madison's October 1787 assertion that the quote-unquote mutability and injustice of the laws of the states had contributed more to that uneasiness which produced the convention and prepared the public mind for general reform than those which accrued to our national character and interest from the inadequacy of the confederation. Close quote. A growing number of historians of the Constitution acknowledge that one of its architects' most pressing goals was to transfer certain key responsibilities from the state legislatures to a new national government capable of resisting pressure from below. Some scholars go still further showing that the framers' anti-democratic ideology was rooted in their disgust at the damage state governments had allegedly done to the economy. But most of these historians, who focused on the elitist character of the Constitution, commit an important error of their own, mistaking the Federalists' biased assessment of the crisis that led to the Constitution for reality. So pause. If you've read the whole book, you know there was a great deal of propagandizing, involved, including and not limited to outright lies about what really was... Uh, what really was going on? What what were the reasons for what what the Constitution promised? And what so the, the Federalist Papers, for example, if you are reading the Federalist Papers, you are reading propaganda. Now that doesn't mean it's of no value, but in one of the most famous uh, books on this topic, uh, written by this guy, written by Bernard Balin. So Bernard Balin's book, written in his youth, what it was uh, on the ideology of the American Revolution. It was a collection of pamphlets used in the American Revolution. So people have a strange, unsophisticated view of this. If you're going to analyze political pamphlets, you know, during a revolution at all times, or you know, in the lead up to a revolution, you know, this to say it's a biased source is an understatement. And the Federalist Papers, likewise, are incredibly biased, and these are presented in high school classrooms and everything else in an unbelievably unsophisticated way. So I'm, I'm here obviously digressing from the text of quoting, but I'm filling you in with something something the reader might already know or appreciate uh, by they got to the, well, they got to this point uh, in the text that I'm now quoting. I, I, uh, I continue my quotation. In the damage they do to American civic life, these writers surpass the amateurs and the ill-informed. During the 1780s, they say, some of the most prominent men in the nation accused the American farmer of proving himself incapable of running the country, and the farmer was guilty as charged. The framers carved this accusation of plebeian incompetence into the cornerstone of the evidence. Great, one verbal typo for you. The framers carved this accusation of plebeian incompetence into the cornerstone of the edifice they constructed in Philadelphia. And although the document has been amended, the attitude that spawned it has not. Today, Americans exude immense pride in their democratic republic, but beneath that surface, sentiments lurk. Ah, ah, he needed a, he needed a hyphen there. Beneath that surface sentiment lurk nagging feelings, not only that you can't fight City Hall, but that you shouldn't, 
since we all know what happens when ordinary folk get their hands on the levers of power. Those at least are the messages conveyed both by the structure of the federal government, which was also the model used in subsequent revisions to the state constitutions and by the history lessons that buttress it. So just going to, uh, just going to uh, digress here to mention, we've been reading a couple of the state constitutions and uh <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, look, guys. I mean, I don't know who is still who is still motivated to come in and uh, uh, come in and and troll this uh, this comment section. <laughs> Have you read the book? <laughs> um, you know, uh, as as this YouTube channel becomes more and more erudite in tone, maybe we'll get a higher and higher quality of uh, of uh, troll coming in to disrupt us, to disrupt us in more and more inspirational and, and instructive ways. Um, Anyway, you know, when you look at the state constitutions, um, it's interesting to note the first was the Constitution of Massachusetts. So for those of you who are not American, Boston is the leading city of Massachusetts, and it was an important place in the Revolutionary period. It's still a somewhat important place today, but not as important as it was back then. Um, Massachusetts, just for the state, just for the state, their House of Representatives had about 400 people in it at the time of the, the, the time of the constitution in this era. And it grew and grew to have more than 700 people. in it. So just at the state level to have 400 people representation by population rep by pop, as we say in Canada. And then as the population grew and the number of towns grew, um, they had 700 people meeting to express the will of the local farmers. Or what have you. So that was an idea of democracy very different from the federal constitution of the United States of America, which began with only 65 people. There are only 65 representatives in the House of Congress. So just the state of Massachusetts, which is really built around the unique economy of Boston at that time, 400 going to 700, as opposed to at a, at a national scale, um, you know, uh, only, only 65 people. So, I mean, uh, quantitative differences have qualitative significance. When are we talking about a democracy and when are we talking about what Aristotle would call an oligarchy and indeed an aristocratic oligarchy at that? Um, you know, how many thousands, if you had the same uh, ratio of representation, obviously there are thousands and thousands of people um, in the American House of Congress, which could also be a terrible system of government, incidentally. But yeah, uh, these, are, uh, these are interesting questions that are both asked and that Americans refuse to ask themselves in looking back at this, this period of history. As I said in an earlier video, why is it that the American Constitution is less democratic than the 13 state constitutions at Challenge Number Place? And why is it less democratic than the ancient constitutions of Athens, of Rome? You can pick your own. I, I think you, it's even less democratic than, say, uh, you know, medieval Florence and Venice and so on. Sparta is a more interesting debate to get into. Is America more or less democratic than Sparta? And whose version of Sparta are we uh, evaluating? At least, at least in Sparta, they had a vote before going to war, right? And it was a democratic decision for whether or not to start the war. So there was, there was more democracy in Sparta than you might think. There was no vote in the United States of America before the start of the war in Iraq or the start of the war in Afghanistan. There's no vote now at the end either. We're not going to have a referendum uh, on the war, nor, nor did they ever at any point. In the United States. Okay, final paragraph in this little passage of, of Mark Dutch we read here. Quote, of course, the safeguards against grassroots pressure that were built into the American political system are much less rigid than those found in countries that do not even claim to be republics. On the other hand, they are considerably more insidious. The framers designed the federal government to be much less accessible than it seems. As Zephaniah Swift put it in, in 1792, let me just say one of the delights of this book is just the names. If you're looking for good baby names, you should buy this book. You, you weren't going to name your kid Zephaniah or Adonijah. There are all these great revolutionary era names that have disappeared. They haven't just disappeared from the English language. They disappeared from the Hebrew language. A lot of these are like garbled Hebrew names. But anyway, As Zephaniah Swift put it in 1792, ordinary Americans are, quote, told that nothing confines them, close quote, and yet they remain impounded. The sinister beauty of the Constitution, in particular the immensity of congressional districts, is that when citizens find they cannot influence national legislation, their tendency is not to curse the system, 
but to blame themselves. I'm going to read that sentence one more time. Not a lot of rhetorical fireworks in this book, but that is a nice moment he left for the very end of the volume. This is not the last page, but this is the, the concluding, uh, concluding few pages of the volume. The sinister beauty of the Constitution, in particular the immensity of congressional districts, is that when citizens find they cannot influence national legislation, their tendency is not to curse the system, but to blame themselves. Oh, so here's here's an interesting question. So, guys, I, I will come back to the question from Creative Nothing, uh, but obviously, I'd, at this moment, it'd be nice to answer some questions directly related to what I've just read you from Woody Holden's book. Frida asks, to what extent was their race, racist migration policy to have a preference for Northern European side of the U.S. Uh, shaping American democracy? Right. Well, so I've got a book here I haven't read yet, but uh, th this is really the book on that topic, and maybe it is not honest enough. So the subtitle for this one is The Peopling of British North America, 1600 to 1675. So even that phrase, the peopling of. So, you know, the active genocidal elimination of the indigenous people and the active importing of different types of Europeans. Now let's ask a further question. Uh, what about the level of education of the white Europeans who are being imported? And this is one of the trickiest things to measure of all, the level of education of the Europeans who remained in North America, because there were highly educated Europeans who came from England to the United States, for example, and a lot of them went back. You know, you can imagine if you're a lawyer, if you're any, any kind of a person with a, with a successful career and you're highly educated medical doctor, you might try your luck. You come from England out to the colonies, the same way many went to say India, another difficult and dangerous calling. You might stay for five years, 10 years, or 15 years. And then once you had the opportunity, whether you'd saved up some money or you'd lost all your money, you'd go back to England. So you were disproportionately getting the roughest, uh, the least educated, and the most brutal you know, uh, sort of people who were coming and staying. But you know, um, the other thing to remember, Frida, is we're talking about an era when there was no formal education, none. And by the way, not even for medical doctors. <laughs> Um, look into how medicine was taught, how people wrote the exams to certify themselves as the medical doctors in that era, even to become a naval surgeon, which was about the most verified form of surgeon in the British Empire, was to, to say, hey, I have, the, I have the paperwork to perform surgery on behalf of the British Navy. Um, it was a joke. You could just study independently and show up and write an exam. And there were some embarrassing revelations that you could study for about two weeks and know everything you needed to know to write that exam. So formal education didn't exist. So when you say, oh, well, what, like if, if you're asking about the ethnicity of people who settled North America, really what you're getting at is their traditions culturally and the type of education they have largely just through talking to their own grandparents, going to church and, and what have you. And indeed reading the English Book of Common Prayer, this sort of thing. So yeah, that was even more important at that time because of the weakness of or total absence of uh, book learning among the particular combination of white Europeans. But yeah, one of the things I know that uh, Bernard Balin is interested in writing this book, and again, he was about 90 years old when he wrote this, so he's an old man at the end of a long and successful career. I'm not his, I'm not his biggest fan. I'm, I am a much bigger fan of Woody Holden here. Um, Americans often are in denial about the extent to which they were German and things like that, that they weren't all British, that it was a very strange assemblage. I mean, Melissa herself you have the map of the United States written all over your face, Melissa. <laughs> Do you know that's an old thing? You, you, you with the map of Ireland written all over your face. That's the old, that's the old thing. So I'm saying, Melissa, you know, you, uh, i.e., you carry the American character in your, in your face. But Melissa is a mix of Northern European and German, and you have some English in you. Yes. What percentage of you is is English from England? Twenty five percent. Oh, not bad. It's more more than I would have gambled on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we all share this kind of phony British Empire identity. But, um, you know, again, it's circa 1600 to 1675. And given that people had so little access to book learning. Uh, no, it's 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 of terrible, crucial importance. Now, sorry, the other contrast I want to make, you know, I don't have the books here, it doesn't matter. But I don't have to hold up every book I mention. Um, but, you know, I am very interested in Machiavelli 
and the separate. Oh, we had a hummingbird at the window. It's already gone. <laughs> the separate but powerfully related history of uh, democracy in Renaissance Italy. Well, think about all the all the things you can take for granted in Renaissance Italy, or even on the tiny island of of Cyprus. That people really do have a common language, a common education, common sort of sense of hierarchy, um, common sense of cultural values, and those will. I mean, in, in the case of Italy. They partly did take pride in democracy. They partly did take pride in the idea of the republic. And they saw no contradiction in being devout Catholics and supporting this idea of democracy and republic. They, that's what that's how they saw their culture. They felt that that was their unique uh, fusion of elements. Like they were aware they weren't, you know, they weren't living in Jerusalem. They weren't, they didn't represent Israeli civilization or something like this. Um, they didn't represent the Old Testament culture in that sense, that they represented this, from their perspective, continuous culture of uh, republics and democracies that had fused with the Judeo-Christian tradition in this powerful way. That was, that was their sense of pride and joy. So they expressed this, for example, and um, again, completely unironically, um, saying that particular Christian saints were the patron saints of their system of democracy and of their constitution, which it's, I mean, it's completely fictional. I mean, by the way, guys, you, you might or might not know this. But um, the, the myth for Europeans uh, to explain the existence of the aristocracy was that they were the people uh, who had fought um, in uh, the, the, the Battle of Troy. So, you know, most of you will be aware there is this myth about the Trojan horse and the Helen of Troy. Like, you'll have some vague memory of this. Well, why did that matter? Why is that famous in places like France that are very far removed from... Well, the, the myth was that the aristocrats, the reason they were different from normal people was that they were the descendants of the heroes who fought in the Trojan War. I, it's, I mean, if you think it's, uh, where is it more ridiculous, in Russia or France or Germany? But people lived with a lot of this mythology that allowed them to uh, kind of render sacred in a Christian sense, a totally pagan tradition of uh, republicanism and, and democracy materials that were there for someone like Machiavelli were very, very different from Joseph. But, oh, right. And so the other people we've left out here are the Dutch. And, you know, some, some of the positive characteristics, I mean, I don't want to go into great length here, but some of the distinctive positive characteristics of American democracy that set it apart from medieval Italy, doubtless uh, came from the Dutch, including, for example, the reluctance to just torture people to death. <laughs> because people were really being tortured to death in that period in Italy, the whole, the whole Catholic world. Um, now, Protestants killed lots of people too, don't get me wrong. These were very brutal empires. But some of the hygienic conceptions and uh, enlightened conception of government, the, the Dutch were extreme proponents of that. The, you know, modern hygiene was basically invented in the Netherlands. It's a funny story, but the, the, the idea of washing your hands, the idea that disease is transmitted by touch, um, the, the, the people of the Low Countries, what am I going to call them? Um, the people of the Netherlands, that was really where a lot of that began. And they had their own response to the French Revolution and uh, prior to the French Revolution. They, they had their own real discourse going on. In many ways, they were a failed world empire. They didn't become a great world empire the way England and, uh, and France did and so on. But sure, they're another important component there. So yeah, sorry, that's a, that was a long answer to, to, a, to a short question. But yeah, I mean, if you if you want to get serious about it, there's there's a question of how the American character emerged out of those um, yeah, components or ingredients, and they were being mixed together in a context where everyone, everyone had blood in their hands from the ongoing genocidal wars. Everyone had blood in their hands from slavery. Um, and e even the people who were trying not to, I mean, really Boston was the source, was the center of anti-slavery activism and their their own constitution rejected slavery and they they declared themselves a free port and so on but you know then people were tainted that way also you sort of even if you were opposed to it you were tainted and cut up in it on, on the other side for those uh centuries okay um do, 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 do. All right, so we have some good questions, but I think I will go back and pay my my donor who uh, who, who paid money for me to answer the question. You know, there's there's a mention here about discrimination towards Eastern Europeans. Uh, so Frida, if you do the research, I mean, look, everyone likes to complain. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> 
when you've studied the history of First Nations people, I mean, like where I was out in Saskatchewan, we had complaints that the Ukrainians were oppressed. These are ethnic Ukrainian immigrants to Canada. We had complaints that the Francophones were oppressed. So these were French speaking people who had one way or another migrated out to Saskatchewan and that part of Canada. And, you know, it just, it doesn't endure scrutiny, especially not when you're in the context of doing research on the, the often parallel and simultaneous history of what's being done to the indigenous people. I mean, you know, sure. I guess if you had a Ukrainian accent um, or a long, difficult to spell Ukrainian name and you were living in Canada in those centuries, you had some slight disadvantage, but the reason why those Ukrainians are still farmers today in Canada is that they were given free land. Guess who wasn't given free land? Exactly the people who the land was taken away from. You know, guess what? For some reason, there aren't a lot of black people who own farms, you know, in Saskatchewan. For some reason, they weren't actively recruiting. And they could have. The British Empire, who were the same polity as, you know, Jamaica and so on. Now, these, we could have been recruiting Caribbeans to come up and farm and giving them free land. So, no, I mean, a lot of those claims, um, everyone likes to complain. Everyone likes to kind of tell this history in a way that makes them the victim. I suppose because they're horrified at the thought that they too are one of the victimizers of the indigenous people and to some extent of the uh, black African slave groups. But no, uh, I, I think if you just do a little bit of uh, a little bit of digging, you'll start to lose patience with that with that discourse. Okay, so a pivot, as Barack Obama would say, but Barack Obama loved that word pivot. Uh, he was a man full of pivots, that Obama. <laughs> You notice how nobody gives a damn what it is on any topic today. It's funny how people who have the power to kill you, suddenly their opinions doesn't matter anymore once they've lost, lost the ability. Once they've lost the ability to have you executed, everyone loses interest <laughs> in their perspective on politics. Anyway, um, so the question was, uh, is it worthwhile to promote politics through fiction? And then interestingly, uh, the examples are manga or books. Manga here meaning comic books, especially in the, the uh, Japanese style, to young adults. So is it worthwhile to promote politics or maybe specifically the philosophy of nihilism, you suggest in parentheses, uh, to young adults through fiction? So, you know, we had a long walk this morning. We walk for exercise in this uh, period. This is We're still under lockdown here. The coronavirus epidemic is still ongoing in this uh, uh, part of Canada. And, you know, I said to Melissa this morning, I felt that one of the differences between myself and other young people when I was a young person was that I really understood and really appreciated that if you make art, you are making it for someone. You are making it for an audience. You are not making it uh, for yourself, you know. And I, I think that really is the solution to the riddle here. Now, once you recognize that, you have a lot of difficult questions to ask you. So to give an example, and by the way, what I'm explaining here, it is not the difference between success and failure. You could have a very successful stand-up comedian who has no interest in his audience whatsoever. You could have someone who decides to become a stand-up comedian and they have a very, let's say they're an alcoholic. They're a guy who likes to go out, get drunk and make people laugh. <laughs> a purely hypothetical example. You know, a guy who has his own his own sense of what's funny and what's not, and maybe likes to ridicule people a little bit, likes to poke fun at his friends when he's out drinking. I'm not. I hadn't even thought of. I actually met one stand-up comic who was like that. I, I could I could tell his story now. Interesting guy. But anyway, you might get into stand-up comedy with no interest in the audience, or even a kind of disdain and contempt for what the audience finds funny, and you you're just a rollicking, self confident person. You get on stage and tell jokes. Now that could be a disaster. You know, you could, um, the vast majority of stand-up comics fail, but obviously some people with that attitude, you know, will be successful. Um, but once you understand or once you accept that this isn't about me, this isn't something I'm doing for myself, this isn't self-expression, this is something I'm doing for others and something I'm doing for the audience, then you really get into a question of um, do you have enough love in you? You know, do you love that audience enough? Is there a public you want to reach out to? Is there somebody you respect enough uh, to make that effort, to take that time, to create that work of art, to, you know, write that, write and perform that comedy, uh, whatever it might be that you're, that you're undertaking as a venture. 
So sorry, our beautiful hummingbird is back. I don't know if you've got it. Okay. We could set up a second camera. Can we do split screen? No, we get the view out the window. That'd be good. Add some add some matte shots here of the hummingbird out the window. <laughs> we have we have a good climate for uh, for for hummingbirds. So you know, um, I mean, look. Sorry, I assume this guy is still in the audience. You can tell me to what extent you think I'm I'm answering your question. What extent I'm not. It's very easy to look at your book. Like if you're if you're writing a book, I should hold a blank book here, ideally. <laughs> Just hold this book backwards. <laughs> you're writing a book. It's easy to think about this book as if it's the end and the objective in itself. Like you're creating this work of art, you're creating this object just to exist. And, it's, and you're not. You have to have a connection to some kind of public, to some kind of audience that you're writing for. Now, you know, um, uh, I, I've said that to Melissa too, in terms of making YouTube videos, you know, one way to do it, it's not the only way to make YouTube video. You can think about who is this for? You can think about like, I'm like, okay, I know some particular people in the audience here. I know Lydia, I know Frida. Now we've been talking. I could make a video where I really consciously and intentionally think, okay, I know Frida is going to see this. I know Lydia is going to see this. And I'm going to, I'm going to make this video talking about the history of genocide or slavery or something. And I'm going to try to make this mean something to this person from Mexico. I know a few things about from like, you know, as small as that may be, if there are five people, you know, you're creating art for where you have that connection and where you, you know what it's going to be for them. And it's falsifiable, by the way, you know, you can write a, a comic book or write a novel and you give it to those five people and they say to you, eh, this doesn't, this doesn't work for me. I don't even know what the point is. You know, sorry, this seems self-indulgent. That's a very different thing than the way most people take on, you know, creative projects, art projects, and and, and writing projects. And obviously, I'm saying all this because in some ways it's a good thing about the internet that you get to take on projects on a small scale without committing too much time or money, you know, to do that. So look, the question was: should you, you know, pursue political change or even philosophical education of the public? through fiction. Okay, so let me ask you, what else you got? We just saw um, kind of the latest propaganda news from Hong Kong. For some reason this morning, didn't get any news from Afghanistan, didn't get any news from Iraq, where American democracy is working out great. <laughs> There's just no problem with democracy in Iraq or Afghanistan. There are no intellectual dissidents there who I need to see interviewed on the news. But, you know, I, I wake up today and I get some propaganda from Hong Kong and about how these uh, poor, peaceful protesters, <laughs> sorry, the protests in Hong Kong were not peaceful. They were massively damaging and massively disrupting and destroyed the subway system. Or okay, but these, these peaceful protesters in Hong Kong, their lives have been ruined because they protest against the government of communist China in this way. Huh. Okay. So you asked a question here. Is it worthwhile to promote political change and even some philosophical ideas through fiction? Okay, well, would you rather go to jail? <laughs> you know, how does that compare to other modes of so-called self-expression and the pursuit of political and cultural change that we have as options in our lives? Now, I don't know what situation you're in. Specifically, so if we're talking about Hong Kong, specifically, if you're a Hong Kong intellectual, probably manga is a great option. Instead of breaking the subway system, instead of causing physical and economic damage to the city you're living in, uh, you know, instead of engaging in violent protest, and there was indeed some burning and looting and what have you, you know, instead of physically fighting against the police, you know, and uh, doing these kinds of things, how would it compare? If you think about just five years of your life, like if you think about five years of life, we have this one moment of rebellion, violent rebellion, followed by some number of years in and out of court, in and out of jail, and so on. And then, of course, you look ahead to 50 years of your life in full context. How would that compare to if you spent five years working on what you think is a really great work of art, a great work of fiction? You're suggesting a comic book or, a, a, you know, a, maybe an animated movie or something, a cartoon or something. You know, how how would that compare? And certainly Hong Kong, and you know, you could you could publish in Japan, and so on. You could work with artists in Japan or South Korea. They all have manga culture, also, and this kind of thing. Well, no matter how humble, no matter how pathetic the road taken by the author of fiction may seem, that starts to seem pretty positive in that in that context. And last live stream, so uh, episode zero zero three. 
I talked at quite some length about how Voltaire is one of the most positive uh, examples. You know, uh, one of the most positive. Uh, I, I, anyway, I mean, someone who wrote something. Even, I'm sorry, even though the book is terrible, <laughs> his writing is awful. But he had this profound impact in the world that nobody has ever had by holding up a protest sign or chanting or singing or, you know, the types of protests that year 2020 you had in the United States. Of America. What did they, they burn down a Kentucky Fried Chicken? That was it? Yeah. It was KFC, wasn't it? Wendy's. Sorry. Got them. That's right. It was a Wendy's. You know, I just do not believe that burning down a Wendy's is going to end police brutality. And as humble and pathetic as it may sound to, you know, write a work of literature or create a create an animated movie to really address police brutality, that sounds a lot better than burning down a Wendy's to me. That sounds a lot better to the riots that killed far more innocent civilians than they killed policemen. And I did read the detailed accounts of they were innocent black people killed by other black people at these protests. It's terrible. That lasts forever, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, <laughs> comment from the audience. Wendy's also ends many people's lives. <laughs> That's consensual, Frida. That's consensual. So, um, and, and Wendy's is not going to, uh, uh, is, is not going to. Someone wrote in. So I think, I think Melissa Moen has, Melissa is out of your league. There you go. That's, that's, uh, guys, if, if you prefer Melissa's content, you're getting plenty of it on my YouTube channel. We just uploaded one today, but Melissa does have her own YouTube channel. So those who, those who are bigger fans of Melissa than mine. There's enough uh, content from the both, both of us uh, to go around. So, <laughs> so here's a comment from Wicked Energy. Quote, I can't believe how many trolls are in chat, but can they get hashtag free Melissa trending? Yes. No, no, no hashtag free Eisel. I ask. <laughs> anyway, guys, look, I tell you two things. One, it comes to the territory. But two, you know, um, if you're talking about trolls, you know, I encourage critique. I encourage dissent. For the record, when, um, uh, pardon me, when Unnatural Vegan crossed swords with me, you know, um, the, the, the emails are now public. You know, the emails I back with. The main thing I said to her was, look, if you want to criticize my work as a scholar of Buddhism, if you want to criticize me as a person, just read it first. Just do the reading. I'm so happy to have you. Like, even if you think my work is trash, if you think what I have to say about uh, the history of Buddhism is is garbage or something, by all means, have at it. You know, let's 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 hear what you got. Criticize it as harshly as you as you possibly can, but you have to do the reading first. You can't uh, you can't criticize it out of out of sheer ignorance. And you know, um, I mean, I, I really haven't. I mean, and she didn't, by the way. She never did. <laughs> it was completely surreal. I mean, what she said about me was just, it was lies about lies about lies. It was just total, total fiction. And it didn't really even mean anything. For criticism. She called me a cult leader. You know, okay, well, yeah, I'm, welcome to the cult, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, in my, in my cult, we read books and uh, criticize American politics, apparently. Um, and I make about $2.50 out of every video I upload. It's not... It's not much of a call, uh, but you know, um, you know, I, I really wish I had more uh, critics. I wish there were more of a culture of uh, dissent and 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 you know, kind of steel sharpening steel this way. You guys might know this, but I, I'm on a first name basis with the live uh, the live streamer, the YouTuber, uh, Cranky Vegan. You know, we we talk. Um, you know, he knows I've criticized his channel. You know, I think it would be a different world and a better world if he responded by criticizing me back or, you know, you could agree or disagree. I know we've seen that video. We've chatted about kind of unrelated things, but you know, he and I chat every so often. And, uh, you know, I've said this in so many times in a different context. If you engage in film criticism, it doesn't mean you hate film. You're trying to improve film. Um, you know, if people criticize my YouTube channel, it doesn't mean they hate my YouTube channel or trying to destroy, uh, you know, my YouTube channel, like that's, that's really fine for me. I, I'd encourage people by all means, you know, put, put the time and energy in and whatever it is. I mean, I, but you, you guys tell me right now, do you think anyone, do you think anyone is going to make the effort to read a single one of these books I've mentioned and then make a YouTube video saying my interpretation of it is wrong? That has never happened once on the history of this YouTube channel. A few times I criticized a book 
And the author got in touch with me furiously. And I said, well, look, God, you're welcome to respond. Like, what do you, what do you got to say? But like, look, I read your book. This is legit criticism of your book. Like it's legitimate. This is my, you know, this is my analysis of your book. Like, you know, what do you, what do you expect? If you publish a book, unless nobody reads it, it's going to be this kind of critique. Um, but I've never even had one of those authors attempt to answer uh, criticism with criticism. So anyway, uh, yeah, you know, really what I would, what I would like is for, anyway, I'm, I, I'm sure that is asking too much, but obviously people like Durian Ryan, nor vegan, none of them were ever interested in the actual substance or the actual content of what was discussed in my channel. Uh, not about any his historical political uh, issue or, or what have you. Um, okay, one person wrote to me by email disagreeing with me about Aristotle at length. I've got to, I've got to give credit. <laughs> and I still have notes literally on the desktop of my computer to do a follow-up video uh, talking about that guy's criticism. Ultimately, I think he was wrong. I, I do I do stand by my interpretation, but he was a guy who made a kind of concerted effort to argue that my interpretation of Aristotle was was incorrect. So that was in the whole history of the YouTube channel and might be might be unique. <laughs> um, all right, sorry. Uh, 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 man, so uh, this this one passionate critic of my channel, this one uh, one troll keeps. Uh, opening new accounts um, to try to contribute again and again to our, our conversation. So anyway, yeah, someone said, I can't believe how many trolls are in chat. No, it's all the same guy. Today, it's it's exactly one guy. But by all means, reach out to, uh, who, who else used to troll me? Reach out to, um, forgetting the guy's name. Uh, ask yourself, reach out to, <laughs> oh God, this guy's a piece of trash. Anyway, so Lydia, Lydia says she's still my number one fan, so. Yeah. Well, Lydia, if you want to, I can give you banning power, but I think you'd ban everyone but yourself. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, Lydia, by all means, give us, give us an update on your life. We don't, we haven't, we haven't heard much of you in like four years, but you know, yeah, we used to, we used to know you pretty well four years ago or something. So yeah. Uh, all right. So quote, I think a natural vegan doesn't even quite understand what neoliberalism is. Yes. Um, Okay, so I, I don't want to go into a big, long uh, discussion of the psychology of, of a natural vegan, but I think it is fair to say she is the purest kind of phony. I mean, she is, she is really someone who uses words and doesn't, without knowing what they mean. Uh, she's a serial offender at that. She talks about books she hasn't read. You know, she really does quote and invoke ideas she doesn't even have a passing familiarity with. We saw that to a massive extent with um, Peter Singer, you know, and it was like, oh, and then after she met, oh, well, I don't really know anything about Peter Singer, really. It was after, you know, five years of fronting, like you knew the first thing about Peter Singer. And she, that was what she fought with me about, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do assume she has a diagnosed learning disability, a natural vegan. She took many, many, many years to get a lowly BA in philosophy and never did anything beyond that. I, I do. I genuinely think she's a mentally disabled person or a learning disabled person. I mean, I've interacted with her for years and, and watched her for years. I think she, to say that she doesn't know what she's talking about is really an understatement. If you look at, she's done very few live streams. She does very few spontaneous videos, but one of them was about me. You know, she did a live stream after Doreen Ryder and Freely went after me. And she seemed to me very mentally disabled in that and really not able to interact with and speak to the audience. There's a gap between her pre-recorded scripted videos and what she does uh, spontaneously. So, you know, when you when you look at that, you have a sense of that over years because she's she's now someone I've known for like five, five, six years. Maybe it's like seven years by now. I don't know. I mean, she's someone I have some sense for and some feeling for. Yeah, to say that she talks about things without knowing what she's talking about. It is, it is really an understatement. And the controversy about socialism and capitalism, when she came out and made a series of statements about what neoliberalism is and so on, that was embarrassing for her. She got caught with her pants down. But I think that just revealed what she's doing all the time, that she is really skating by with no, without even Wikipedia level knowledge of anything she talks about. Oh, right. So let's say, let's just say really briefly, one of the biggest ones, uh, antidepressants. 
I mean, she made her name by being a so-called pro-science channel. And the one and only topic she ever did research on was Splenda. She she uh, researched artificial sweeteners like Splenda and NutraSweet. And I, again, I've never looked into it. Maybe, maybe that was just the Wikipedia article. But she went around and did some reading to present this uh, this video. But then anything else she's ever spoken on, whether it's you know antidepressants or any other issue that comes up in in science, or cats, uh, you know when she talked about you know raising pets and castrating cats and dogs and things, it's just and you know Peter Singer and everything else. It's to say it's stupid or to say it's ignorant. It's really an understatement. So I see her as someone who is trying to cover up for a learning disability. And that statement about neoliberalism, it was one of the moments when her cover, you know, failed, when it would be obvious to any detached outlook or just how out to see she was. And that was, you know, nobody was rushing her. She was working with her own camera at her own pace and she was her own editor. She could do her own fact check. You know, it wasn't a live stream and it wasn't that she was being uh, pestered by an interviewer or something. And, and even so, you know. Yeah. So uh, Frida says she boasts about taking many antidepressants. So yes, and she took antidepressants during pregnancy with both babies. So antidepressants do harm to your health. Taking antidepressants during pregnancy harms the baby. And that's not hard to Google verify. It's not hard to check into. We did videos talking about that on my YouTube channel. So yeah. Uh, 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 well, so my, my one and only uh, troll here. I thought you got a full-time job, man. You were just boasting the other day. This guy sent me an email saying he was so proud that he had a nine to five job now. And I simply wrote back a one word response. I said, congrats. I said, congratulations. But whatever his nine to five job is, uh, this is uh, this is neither nine nor five at the moment in his time zone. <laughs> um, okay, there was also a question, sir. I, I wanna move on to more profound things. But uh, James McPine is asking about uh, whether or not I have a, uh, a schedule or structure to my days. So we are now waking up around 6 a.m. Our target is 6.30 a.m., but we some days I'm waking up at 5.40 a.m., some days at 6. So waking up early is one aspect. We do try to get exercise every day. Um, there was more structure to my days back when I was learning Chinese and when the challenge was to balance learning Chinese versus doing everything else in my life. I see myself right now as in a transitional period where I haven't finished writing my book. Go to Instagram for updates or support me on Patreon for updates when the book comes out. But I'm trying to finish writing the manuscript of my book and I'm doing research that's related to writing the book. Thus, some of the books that are mentioned in this video today. And, um, you know, presumably I'm going to return to university in September as a student. So, you know, um, right now, no, there's not a whole hell of a lot of structure beyond that. It's, but we, we try to get the most of every day. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard when your life is a series of transitional periods and you never really know what it is you're transitioning to. <laughs> and you, you may be transitioning to nothing at all. Um, to say I'm pessimistic about returning to the University of Victoria would be an understatement. And you can search for University of Victoria in my YouTube channel, and you can find out more about why it is I'm so pessimistic. Mm. Someone comments, quote, I actually really like your videos about Jordan Peterson and about unnatural vegans and antidepressant use. Most people believe the serotonin and dopamine thing. Yes, that's called the monoamine hypothesis, which indeed, uh, you know, <laughs> which is indeed much disproven. Um so he says, I actually like your videos about Jordan Peterson and natural vegans and antidepressant use. Most people believe the serotonin and dopamine thing, uh, even though medicine has moved on to another model. Yeah. There is a book um, that I have not read. Let's see if I can just get this on Amazon. This is a book I considered buying and never, I think it's like 15 bucks. Um, the, the subtitle is The Anatomy of an Epidemic. So I can get it that way. I'll give you guys the link if you're interested. I have seen many interviews with the author who wrote this book. Here we go. Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic. There we go. So hold on. I'm just going to get the 
So this is from the olden days of 2011. Um, and Robert Whitaker, I mean, he's an interesting guy. I think everyone who writes in this field is an interesting guy. So you can get this pretty cheaply. Um, you know, he was not a psychiatrist himself, nor was he a patient. He was really a traditional investigative journalist. But he brings that investigative journalist view to it. And he was himself. So I don't know if you already know this story, babe. Sorry, I just said Melissa. This guy, well, so I, I don't, I hope I'm not getting this mixed up. But this is, this is from memory. But as I recall, when he first started researching this, he completely assumed that these were legitimate, uh, you know, medications just like uh, treating someone with diabetes, you know, like by giving them a chemical that's missing from their body. And he thought he was going to be investigating the unethical practices of these researchers in putting people on the drugs and taking them off. Like, cause if you really believe it's something like that, I mean, you would never, you would never do the same kind of experimentation with someone who was diabetic. Like, okay, now we're going to take you off the drug and see how you recover or see how you attack or something. But as I recall, he gave that as an, as an example that like when he started, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't skeptical about this. He assumed this was just literally biologically valid medical science. And then he starts getting deeper and deeper into it. And he realizes this is just a kind of a, a set of debunked marketing claims that people have come to regard as biologically valid science. Yeah. So uh, interesting guy. I mean, I think genuinely well-intentioned um, in researching and writing that book. And it probably helps him that he's an outsider. I mean, we have just lived through, um, what's his name, completely uh, uh, kind of debunking, discrediting himself. So Peter Bregan, if you guys don't know the name Peter Bregan, he has just made a whole series of really unfortunate conspiratorial remarks about uh, coronavirus and, and the vaccines and so on. And he's shown his limits as an intellectual. You know, I'd seen other things in the past that showed he wasn't the brightest uh, cabbage in the cabbage patch sort of thing, you know, there were certain, but Peter Bregan was really one of the most important voices. Uh, he, he wrote talking back to Prozac and he gave interviews and he really, you know, um, but uh, sorry, let me just say this. It's one thing to be smart enough to criticize antidepressants, which Peter Bregan was, but then, you know, whenever Peter Bregan would turn to talking about the type of treatment he favored instead, you'd think, ah, this guy's kind of lightweight. This guy kind of actually, you know what I mean? You could then see his limits. Like, oh, intellectually, he's not that deep, you know? I don't know if you've heard this, but so I've, I've quoted Peter Bregan many times on my channel. And I, obviously, I have some respect for the guy. But he turned from me, give this really hard hitting critique. This, this is like the film clips that I'm editing to use in my own videos. Like, give this hard hitting critique about like Prozac has been debunked and these are the effects and these are the side effects. This is how we know, you know, give this sort of things. And then he'd say, but you know, the people with these, uh, uh, you know, the people with these problems, if only they could sit down and spend time, you know, with their parents, then they're probably <laughs> if you just spend more time with your loving and supportive family and so on, you know, and again, it's, it's well-intentioned, but, uh, you know, wow. You know, just, uh, anyway, so he's somebody who's kind of fallen from grace, um, in, in uh, 2020 in, in the last year. But yeah, it, it's interesting to see who steps up and who wants to take on that fight. I mean, there is there is so much to win. There's uh, the question of what is the next hundred years going to look like on planet Earth has a lot to do with drugs, legal and illegal. And I mean, what if we if we walk to the grocery store right now? <laughs> you know, the city we live in, the lives we all live, and where we choose to live, and everything. All of this. I mean, drug addiction all around us. And you know, I thought I thought one of the most interesting questions to come out of 2020 was about police being on drugs. If police are taking psychiatric meds or illegal recreational drugs, um, are we gonna start testing police officers for this or right? Like if, if you are taking a drug that is labeled antipsychotic, that is what one class of these psychiatric meds is called, or even if you're taking one that is called antidepressant, are you really competent to hold a gun and make these decisions You know, as a police officer? And I think if you just read the label, about the side effects on those drugs. I, I've seen them I in mean, some of them. We're looking at Haldol. I made a YouTube video talking about Haldol specifically because another YouTuber is taking Haldol. And you're looking at it's like, well, you shouldn't even operate heavy machinery. You know, you may not be able to drive a car. It's like, okay, and these are some of the most widely prescribed drugs in the United States of America. These are the warnings you're getting. Well, okay. And then we're going to have police officers, the power of life and death and making, you know, important judgments. I think that's a really interesting question that came out of this way. So I, I won't go on and on about it. But once you've allowed yourself to ask that question, right, then what? What next? What's the future? You know, what, uh, are school teachers 
allowed to get high? Is it okay if school teachers are using marijuana and cocaine and antidepressants and antipsychotics, if they're walking around in a Haldol and uh, CBD haze? Or, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, you know, more and more you start to ask about who is taking on a responsible role in society and, and why, why should we lower our standards or expectations once we've established those standards for police officers, uh, for example. Um, huh, interesting question from Jonathan L. Because okay, so Jonathan L. asks, did you talk about money and your philosophy? And what part of your morals and ethics would you sell for someone with a more gray outlook? I think I have to ask you, that sounds like an interesting question that needs to be reworded. It sounds like you're getting at something interesting. <laughs> I, I think that was just too unclear. So, Jonathan, I don't know. It could be English as your second language. It could be you wrote that on the phone. There, there are a few different grammars in there. But why don't you? Why don't you give it a second, uh, a second shot? Let's let's see what you got to say. Yeah, it'd be interesting. All right. Okay, so so uh, someone in the audience anonymously, they just give their initials, ST, says this is probably because in a rationalist society, suffering is only taken seriously if it can be biologized or narrativized into a single condition. <sighs> you know, I think the truth is darker than that, ST. I think people take your suffering seriously. If you have the charisma and the art to compel them to take it seriously, you know what I mean? That's, that's really, you know, your suffering only matters if you get out there and make, make it matter, make it matter. You will demonstrate to them why it should matter, why they should care. Then people will care then only then, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I, I guess, you know, I don't think it's the case that in a rational society, once you can identify your suffering with a biologically broken condition that anyone cares, they don't care. I mean, we don't have a very caring society, period. But if you are very charismatic, for example, let's say you were the lead singer of a rock band, you know, maybe you get a good. Hey, can I just ask a question? I just noticed, guys. So we have 28 people in the audience right now. You guys all remember. And we have only six thumbs up. I, I don't mean to complain. But is there some reason, if you've been listening to this for over one hour, you've been in, you've been in the audience, why would you not hit thumbs up? I mean, if you've just been here for five minutes, you're like, let's see how this goes. Let's let's hear him read the passage. Let's see where this goes. Look, it seems to me, if we have such a small audience, we have 28 people in the audience, and I know plenty of you, you know what I'm saying? I, I think we could have a total of 28 thumbs up or something like that. It's, it's, it's no... I, I, you know, there we go. Okay. I, and you guys know when you do that, it means some other people will get the alert and some other people will do this. So you look, I mean, you know, it just seems, you know, whatever. I mean, if you want to give it a thumbs down, you're an hour and eight minutes deep into the broadcast. I, I get it. Maybe it's not cheaper. The last time we did one of the <laughs> people are apologizing. Give it a thumbs up. <laughs> the last time we did one of these live streams, we had two people unsubscribe from my channel because uh, YouTube gives those. And that, I wonder what expectations those two people had. Am I, if that was not what you were looking for on my YouTube channel. <laughs> this is the first time you've ever mentioned thumbs up. You never say, this true? be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I am just asking the question, given the numbers. And you see a, a couple other people just joined because people gave the thumbs up. So I just say a couple more people. A couple people jumped in because that is what happens. YouTube will, uh, will promote your link. But anyway. Okay, I'm um, just scrolling through here. We got some other intelligent comments. Do, 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 do. Okay, so uh, another good question. This relates to Haldol specifically. So James writes in. James says, "What are your thoughts on anti medication? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on medication in relation to things like anti seizure meds?" Look, it's a different story in every case, but when you read the label, when you read the FDA label, so there's the Food and Drug Administration, the United States of America, you get a lot of damning information about these drugs, the FDA label. They will very often admit that the mechanism of the drug is unknown and unproven for the anti-seizure medication. So I've seen several examples of that. I'm not saying this is true in all cases, but a drug like aspirin is very well proven in its effects, in the, in the mechanism of action, the theory behind it, the, the positive benefits you get from treating a fever with aspirin are proven. 
and they make sense. We know etiologically, step by step, mechanistically, cause and effect. How does aspirin affect your body? And therefore, what medical benefits do you get from aspirin, right? You might think aspirin is not a serious drug, but it is, right? Now, aspirin is made from what? What is What plant is aspirin made from? Did, did, did you guys in the audience ever ask? It's made from the opium poppy. Aspirin and heroin are both products of the opium poppy. Now, the uses of opium are also proven. You know what I mean? You are very often looking at psychiatric meds where uh, we was looking at one the other day. It was like, oh, well, this was started to, to, to use to treat cancer patients, and that didn't work. And then they started using it as an antidepressant and antipsychotic because it seemed to have mental effects. Where, you know, it really is people, uh, I'll use somebody else's idiom, people throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks, where there's just been a very short process of trial and error to see what apparent benefits it has. Where often, not always, but often, you know, uh, the real effects of the drug through your whole body are not known. And by the way, also, when you read the FDA label, so to be clear, I'm just encouraging you to read the government's own information. The FDA label, you know, when it's listing those negative side effects to the rest of the body, or even if they're positive side effects, you know, um, it's significant just to be aware, even if you don't suffer those side effects, that it is having effects on all of those symptoms. So if it impacts your, your blood pressure, Think about that. Okay, so this doesn't just affect, you know, my nervous system. This doesn't just affect my, my mental attitude or mood. This also affects my nervous system because it has these side effects. The side effects that are listed are significant also in just telling you what are the parts of the body that are that are somehow agonistically impacted, where there's some receptor, or there's some chemical that is that is impacted by your body. And many of those drugs, again, when you go through the, the list of side effects, it's everything. It's like, okay, this affects your ability to have erections, and this affects your heart, your blood pressure, and it affects your ability to sleep. Many of them, they list that it affects the, the, your regular heartbeat. It affects sleep apnea. It affects your ability to sleep, your ability to breathe during your sleep, the heartbeat, irregular heartbeats while you're asleep. Okay, so this is affecting your nervous system that way. Then really think about that, even if you don't notice it, you know. Wow, these are the knock-on effects. So, you know, I, I just say just really read the with the FDA uh, information. And, you know, the exceptions will be drugs like aspirin. There are some drugs like aspirin where we know the benefits and we know the harms, and it's real science. And naturally, those are those are not controversial. I mean, it's, it's just inevitable, you know. Um, mm, 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 mm. All right, I'm just reading through the comments. You guys know why I'm, if you want to know why I'm momentarily silent here. Okay, so there's a question here from James about objective versus subjective morality. I think I've done that topic to death on my YouTube channel. So I sometimes in invoke YouTubers privilege here. Uh, I will search my own channel, but I think if I just look for the words objective and subjective, I'm going to get those videos. That is, I mean... <laughs> I can't say it's an interesting topic to me. I think it's one of those topics where I seem to be in this tiny minority of people who understand it really clearly. But yes, so I have several videos dealing with that. It's not in its own uh, playlist, but I've got videos dealing with objectivity, responsibility, moral realism versus nihilism, objective morality. I, I do have videos talking about that already. Um, so I think I think that's one I've, I've beaten to death. <laughs> All right. So Frida says, I've heard about aspirin being good to take when you are heartbroken. Okay, so if you're talking about depression, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for this to be a depression, antidepressant uh, live stream, but I mean, it is a big issue that influences a lot of people. We have new studies now that are proving, um, you know, that um, drugs like ketamine, have more of a positive effect on depression than so-called antidepressants. Now, I do not endorse using ketamine to treat depression whatsoever. Jordan Peterson was recently given ketamine. Um, but once you have that standard established, like, oh, well, well, it's more effective than Prozac. Once you understand how low that's setting the bar, sure, sure, it's possible people would use aspirin or ketamine or all, all kinds of drugs that have some kind of um, you know, uh, uh, mind altering effect, of course, they could be more effective. Uh, of course, even, you know, there are studies supporting the use of marijuana. Now I'm opposed to the use of marijuana, but sure. I mean, if you're comparing marijuana to, 
um, Prozac and some of these other really debunked antidepressants. Sure, marijuana could, uh, it could be positive relative to that very low standard. All right, we've got some statements about utilitarianism, which I'm habitually going to skip over. <laughs> mm -mm -mm -mm. So Jonathan clarifies his earlier question. Quote, I just wanted to hear your nuanced thoughts and money. And I believe you're a person who might already have a video too, but I do. I remember a very passionate video I made talking about money and my own motivations for what I'm doing in life. Boy, I don't know if I could find that today, though. Um, I have made videos really talking about, you know, the jobs I've applied for and the jobs I didn't get and, you know, uh, the meaning of money and life and the extent to which, you know, you, the meaning of life is something you pursue despite the pressure and money. I have definitely made videos talking about that. But boy, when you've done more than 2,000 videos, um, it is not easy. I used to have some fans of the channel who'd have all that stuff memorized. They, they're not in this, they're not in this uh, live stream right now. But yeah, no, it's, it's um, boy, I can't remember the name of that video, the particular one I'm thinking of. But I remember making a video. You know, one of the reasons I had to think about it was, Jonathan, um, we both enrolled in Bacon College. And then when you're talking about a career as a baker, you have to really look at how you earned your money as something very separate from the meaning of life. Like, okay, this is who I really am. And this is my nine to five job. More likely to be a 3 a.m. till two in the afternoon job or something. Get up real early as a baker. Well, those things are very separate. So I've definitely made videos, uh, you know, philosophizing about it. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, real simple question. What are your thoughts about the controversy surrounding Bill C-10 in Canada? So I'll just, I'll just, uh, well, I feel like just uh, copying and pasting that here in case people don't know the question. So that is certainly something people outside of Canada have not heard about. Um, look, you know, laws are made by people. The problem with Bill C-10 in Canada is that it shows you that we are ruled by terrible people in Canada. These people aren't so much older than me. I'm 42 now. Uh, Bill C-10 is a very badly worded, very poorly thought through attempt to regulate free speech on the internet. Its primary purpose is to force Canadians to watch Canadian content. Like if you are a Canadian watching YouTube, that you should watch YouTube made in Canada rather than YouTube videos made in the United States or somewhere else. So, and it has been through various drafts and revisions, none of which makes sense. I really think, I mean, if, you were, if I were just talking that with Melissa out of the blue one day, like, hey, what do you think about the idea of having a law that will change free speech? In the internet? How do you think we'd do that? I really think any two reasonably intelligent people having an open-ended discussion would come up with a better set of proposals than that law. It's unbelievably stupid. Um, I just mentioned, I mean, another another kind of thorny example of that from the other side of the world. Every so often in Sri Lanka, there's some law proposed to basically try to delimit Islam, to say, well, look, we believe in freedom of religion, but they have their own problems with Muslim terrorists. They have their own problem with Hindu terrorists also. And they're always very poorly written. And the funny thing is, normally when those things are proposed, the majority of people do agree with them in broad outline. Yeah, somebody should redefine what we mean by freedom of religion, you know, because we don't, we don't really mean the right to cut off part of a baby's penis. It's actually not freedom of religion. We don't believe in circumcision, you know, like there are all kinds of things that really we don't believe in under freedom of religion, but they're currently commonly practiced and unquestioned. So, you know, but... This tells you something about the type of people who are in that privileged position in, in, in Canada. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, if you guys don't know already what a low opinion I have of our, our version of so-called democracy in Canada, by the book. Uh, no more manifestos uh, uh, coming soon. But, yeah, I mean, I just say that bill. I'm sorry if I'm saying this in a slightly inarticulate way. I don't think that tells you anything about freedom of speech. I don't think it tells you anything about Canada. I think it tells you something about the culture and intellectual caliber of the type of people who are in positions of power in Canada. And in brief, that is abysmally poor and uh, abysmally low. 
Da, 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 da. Spicy Dragoon asks, what are you currently doing for work now? You're looking at it. You're looking at it, bro. This, this is what I'm doing for work right now. Believe it or not, believe it or not, this, this is my job. I pay taxes <laughs> on what I earn from doing this job. Um, mm -mm -mm. Oh, so we got it. We got a question about uh, height and weight. So yeah, I am six foot three in the morning. Um, your spine compresses during the day, so I'm about six foot two and a half later on. But yeah, a Durian Rider would be happy to meet up with me now. I mean, I just say he's he's changed his whole tune. Um, you know, very strange guy. But I've had email back and forth with him. So if I did meet up and have a boxing match with Durian Rider now, it would be friendly. There wouldn't really be any hard feelings. So he and I could we could still have a boxing match. You and I. But he's not mad at me anymore. He sees the whole thing in a very different way. And if you, you know, if you didn't know, when he was accused of rape by Norvegan, you know, I did the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Even though Durian Ryder has been an immoral person towards me and others, even though he's a bad person, I was not going to lie out of political convenience and blackness character. I, I said the truth. I said what I knew of the truth and so on. Um, I, I stood up. Uh, you know, I stood into everything and it took him a long time to figure that out and appreciate it. I think just because he wasn't watching my videos or whatever, a very strange guy, obviously. But no, in that sense, there's no conflict, you know, in that emotional sense, there's no conflict between him and I now. Um, he really figured out that I was a person of integrity, that I really was telling the truth about everything. Of course, he also claimed, I'm sorry, just very briefly, but he claimed I was lying about the court case. And he found out I was telling the truth about all that. So I told the truth about everything throughout the whole controversy. But even when it would have been convenient for me to lie or to blacken during my character, I never did that. And I did have evidence. I was a witness to what the reality was before those rape allegations were made up. And I wasn't the only one. There were several other people. And so, you know, that was a very, very strange, sad controversy. But sure, obviously that that impacted the way Durian Ryder sees me, and I think the way he he, uh, he sees myself. Okay. Um, a question from the audience: How come you won't talk about vegan gains? What do you? What do you? God, you guys don't know. There's a search feature within within YouTube. What are you? What are you talking about? How many videos have I done about vegan gains? Should I search for vegan gains plus the word idiot or something? I mean, you know, sorry, but if if you, I'll, I'll give you the link, bro. But if you if you just search for vegan gains in my channel, I mean we've uh, we really kind of said it all. So that's the I'll just mark that's the search search results for vegan gains. What's reasonable was his response to the concept of everything? Oh, on abortion, right? I did an abortion uh, discussion. I also have a video snappy title: "Coward versus Coward, Vegan versus Vegan." That's <laughs> the. Yeah, keeping it real with vegan gains. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So there's a long history of very harsh critique directed towards vegan gains on my channel. Sure. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, it's on the, I think I think it's 191 centimeters, Lazel. Maybe I'm wrong. 191 centimeters in feet and inches, some of that. I, I forget. The only time I have to do that is when I'm filling out paperwork for the government. Some of that 191, 192. It's not a round number. I remember. So yeah, some of that. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, so someone else here is remembering old critiques I did. So this is great. It's nice to have, I mean, when people of substance ask questions of substance, I'm happy to answer it. I mean, uh, but anyway, someone says, thanks for making videos about Earthling Ed. That guy is a sleaze. It makes $10,000 per month in donations, but where does the money go? So look, let's let's list some some names of people who have gotten rich out of veganism and are getting rich right now, and nobody knows where the money goes. Yes, Earthling Ed is one, okay? Wayne Seong and his sister at Direct Action Everywhere, they are now well over $1 million a year. To my knowledge, they are either closer to or beyond $2 million a year in income. You can go to Direct Action Everywhere's YouTube channel right now. Where does the more than $1 million a year go? And you can look up their reports. Uh, Dr. Greger, 
So Dr. Greger, what's the YouTube nutrition facts? Some of that. Dr. Greger, nutrition facts. Are, I've made many videos, multi-million dollar scam. Where is the money coming from? Where does it go? I mean, look, where does the money come from? I, I presume these are all good hearted people who want to make the world a better place or doing this money. But there are millions of dollars going down the drain. Now, look, guys, I have asked for money. I have done fundraisers on my channel before. If I asked you for money to publish my book, you will know where every dollar goes. I'll say, hey, this is how much the paper costs. This is, maybe you have to pay, you know, an illustrator for the front cover or something or for the, you know, this is how much we paid the illustrator. This is how much the shipping, like just break it down and say, hey, if you donated money to the book and now presumably I send you a free copy of the book or I sign it and send you and say, hey, thank you for supporting the publication of this book. That's how you do charity. Guys, I, I used to be involved with the humanitarian sector. I'm still tempted. We talked about Central Asia. I would love to go back to Cambodia. I would love to go back to Laos and do humanitarian work. If I ask you guys for money, I can give you a receipt for every blanket. <laughs> like, yeah, we bought 10 t-shirts and 10 blankets. And I can make a YouTube video. This is me handing the blanket to the poor person. And here's your receipt. That's the reality. And then nobody is being ripped off. And if if some of the money is being spent on my hotel room or whatever, just be real about it. Just be like, yep, this is the hotel we got. This is where I'm staying. Who, like, why not? Why not be transparent? Um now, you know, I just say, I mean, I normally do not. So this is a live stream. It's a little bit more informal. If I were making a video about Earthling Ed, I would never call him a sleaze because that is an insult that is too vague to mean anything. All right. I think it's an idiot. I'll tell you exactly what I mean by an idiot. I think his philosophy is bullshit. I think his method of activism is totally counterproductive and moronic. I think his videos are meandering and self-indulgent and stupid. I think people donating his money would be just as well off to take their money and put it in the toilet and hit flush. You know, I will tell you what I think, but I, I do not call people a sleaze. I do not call people a creep unless there's some particular reason. I, I just say, like, I avoid this kind of vague insult or vague complaint. I don't do. So I just, just a recommendation, UDS, whatever it is you got to say about everything, Ed, say it, but like to call him a, like, I don't even know what that means in some other, if we're talking about Hollywood and you say, this guy is a sleazy casting agent. Okay. I have a sense of what you mean, but I do not know in what sense earthling Ed could be called. I mean, he is poorly groomed. He's badly dressed and badly shaven, but like, is that what you mean by, you know what I mean? So insults should mean something. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I would even say the same about like rap music. You know, if you're going to rap about somebody the, and you're going to insult somebody in a rap song, it's got to be precise. You know, you've got to come correct, you know. <laughs> um, uh, Lazul uh, Lapoli, pardon me, Lazul Lapoli, it's a good Pali pronunciation of that. Uh, Lazul Lapi, I don't know how she spell that. <laughs> um, comments that she doesn't even know what Vegan Gaines is doing. I agree. And if you look at his numbers, they've they've disappeared. He's alienated the vast majority of his audience. Nobody wants to know what he's doing. Unless, and you know, he's now doing porn. So if you want to see him naked, he's now doing hardcore porn on uh, on OnlyFans. But nobody cares. And you know, I mean, you know, um, I left a comment recently on one of uh, Freely's videos. I said, you know, this is what would happen if Hollywood just kept making Indiana Jones movies again and again and again. There's no inspiration. There's no point. There's no purpose. There's no verve. There's no passion. And, you know, I could say the same about vegan games. It's just the the level of self-indulgence and pointlessness in its contents. It's palpably awful. And by the way, I got other stuff I wanted to read and want to talk about here. It's great talking to you guys. But, you know, I'm, th there's stuff I'm really passionate about. And as soon as I hang up the phone here. There's stuff I want to get back to doing too. I've got I've got a lot of passion and tenacity and verb and sense of purpose. I have a lot of ambition, and that's why I'm coming on the microphone as often as I am. But if you're not, if you're a mopey, self pitying piece of crap like Vegan Gaines who just wants to sit around and play video games all day, don't don't come on the mic. He would have been better off doing what Aaron Janis did. Aaron Janis uploading less than one video a year, but she maintains the mystique, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone imagines Aaron Janis is doing something tremendously profound and meaningful, you know. Well, you can let your imagination run run wild. So anyway, uh, I got a question about how do you deal with anti-Semitism? So again, I got to kind of use YouTubers' privilege here. If you search for anti-Semitism on our channel, you get some. I think I think I've made some really meaningful videos about that. I have one video in which I'm talking to my daughter about anti-Semitism. So, you know, and also I made a video about the ideological origins of the Nazi movement, you know, which I 
So I just say uh, two things to search for. You can look for the video on the origins of the Nazi ideology, and you can look at the video which I'm talking to my daughter about anti-Semitism. Sure, it's a big deal. And it's it's not, it ain't something new that just came out of nowhere, and it's not just about to go away. We have a donation of five euros that's gonna pay for me to buy a new a new jar. I think these are about two dollars each, these jars. Beautiful, beautiful jar, beautiful piece of glassware, almost indestructible, too. All right. Quote, do you think there is anything useful that can be learned from meditating or from Buddhism? Uh, and if so, is it something that you can't get from prayer or Christianity? Ah, all right. It's a good thing you paid me $5. <laughs> all right. You know, what does my background in studying Buddhism, you know, give me today? This world is roughly spheroid in shape. Can't quite say it's a sphere. It's a little bit bigger around the middle. It bulges and flat at the top. And you know what I mean? Let's just let's just call it a sphere and be done with it. Okay, guys. In the whole world, historically, how many civilizations have extant massive literature? Literature about philosophy, literature about politics. China, India, Europe. Okay. Pre-contact South America, South America and Central America, before Europeans came and destroyed everything, they did have writing. They did have written language. The Spanish destroyed it. Europeans destroyed it. Let's not, let's not blame the Spanish, especially the Portuguese and the French and the British. We were all involved. Europeans destroyed their written literature, including the physical substrate, like what it was written on was destroyed. Okay. So in some other parallel universe, it's possible. They wrote meaningful things down in indigenous North America, indigenous South America. But in terms of what is extant today, that is about all you've got to work from. Um, now, okay, one tier down. What about Islam? What about the Arabic speaking world? You could add that and have a fourth. So now you got China, India, Europe, Arabia and the parts of the world that were conquered and influenced by Arabia started using the Arabic language. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you going to live your life only knowing one of those four? Are you going to be kind of intimidated and ignorant anytime one of the other three come up? I mean, most white Western English speaking people don't even really have much familiarity with the canon of English literature, or English politics let alone French, Italian, Spanish, ancient Greek, or, or what have you. Um, the main thing I can say that's a positive benefit from knowing Buddhism is that you get to know another one of those cultures, one of those corpuses of literature that's full of politics and philosophy and the human experience. Right? You get to see all those things from another perspective on another side of the planet. right? And that's all I can say in its favor. If you don't know, I've made many videos about meditation. Buddhist meditation is a lie. If you believe in Buddhist meditation, you believe in a lie, right? Anyone who teaches or preaches or promotes Buddhist meditation is making money and promoting their career on the basis of a lie, right? I know, you know, which one do you prefer? You want the Tibetan lie? You want the Japanese lie? You want the you want the Sri Lankan lie? You know, no, it's all lies. Um, if you compare it to prayer in Christianity, the advantage that prayer has is that it's been so thoroughly debunked. Is that people are skeptical in in Europe and in Canada and the United States? If you say to someone that you're going to solve their problem through prayer, people are apprehensive. And people mysteriously are not apprehensive at all. They're not skeptical at all. They're willing to believe in meditation without asking any of the questions that they would they would apply to Christian prayer. So if you don't know, I was a scholar of Buddhism for many years. I learned the Pali language. I lived in Asia. I did put a lot of years and a lot of work into it. Um, I don't get a whole lot out of it in terms of what I do in my life now, but you can learn from my experience. I wrote numerous articles that are still on the interview, that are still on the internet. And, um, you know, you can just watch the 
the playlist, the, the, the Buddhist playlist on this YouTube channel. I don't even know. It's a hundred videos deep, but sure. There's, there's plenty of depth and plenty of breath there. Okay. Right. So I'm going to get back to reading the book. I think we'll wrap things up. Reading your comments now, guys. So someone says that earthling as smarminess makes him puke. Oh, and then he comments that Earthling Ed loves himself. I don't feel that way about Ed. I think he's self-loathing. I don't think he loves... I don't think that, you know? Um, I remember Earthling Ed talking about confronting strangers on the street about wearing fur, that kind of thing. I'm a very self-confident person. I don't think Earthling Ed is a self-confident person, not at all. I think he's a self-doubting, self-hating person. It's just, it's just how I feel about his character, just being real with you. I think he's a small, reedy guy. And what is his actual name is, is Gaunt, right? Wasn't that it? <laughs> yeah, he had this peculiar last name that, that draws attention to how gaunt he is. You know, he has this name that seems like a joke about how, how kind of scrawny he is. I don't, you know, I, let me put it this way too. He's not self-confident being the leader of a political movement. I don't think he's self-confident being the manager of a restaurant, you know, which is now part of his job. He, he said, I don't think he's self-confident in any of the roles he's taken on. And look, let's be real. I don't think he's well-read. I do not think he's well-read on any topic, like in politics. Well, I don't think he's well-read about veganism. He's not well-read about anything, you know, so he's really kind of scraping by. I think he's a very shaky, you know, self-doubting, self-hating character. And I don't dislike him for that. That's just my reading. That's just how I feel about him. Um, I, th I think he's a guy who's doing these speaking engagements and feeling that he's just very, barely scraping by, by, by the seat of his pants, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I just say, and you know, um, what it is people like about him or what it is they hope he'll accomplish. That's really the mystery to be unfolded. Cause I don't really see earthling Ed making any false promises to people. Um, he just says, give me your money and I'll make it disappear. <laughs> That's always promising. And, you know, people are still lining up to give him, to give him more money. All right. Uh, someone asks, someone says that Earthling Ed is promoted by the same people that promoted Tim Sheaf. Yes, absolutely true. No, that's actually good. That's actually an insightful comment from Frida. The same people who would line up to support Timothy Sheaf in his period of vegan activism would line up to support Earthling Ed. And they probably see him as a very legitimate vegan activist for that reason, by that, by that con, uh, by that low standard. Uh, great, great question, but I don't want to do a one hour monologue on it. What's your perspective on the Israel Palestine conflict? So I was joking that nobody ever asked me this the other day. So here's someone, here's the exception to prove the rule. Uh, I think a lot of my, my viewers, uh, Xerxes already know my perspective on that. Cause I have made videos talking about it. So that's one reason why they don't ask about it. Um, but sure. I mean, you know, ev everyone seems to delight in pretending they're an expert on the Israel-Palestine conf conflict. And I suppose I delight in feeling that I know more than those who call themselves experts. Because sure, I, I, I think what's uh, what's said in the mainstream media is really a joke. Um, everyone kind of blows the dust off their file in the file for Oh, it's time to pretend that we care about the Israel-Palestine conflict again. And, you know, all that anyone is promising, certainly all that Joe Biden is promising is precisely that things will go back to business as usual, that things will return to normal. Very few people are aiming at any kind of um, long long term change to the status quo, uh, to what you know. Frankly, Western democratic political elites have gotten used to over over recent decades, and that's why it's most likely going to continue. What's what's the situation, the status quo for the last several decades? It's comfortable for Hamas, it's comfortable for the PLO, i.e., for the elite members of these groups. It's comfortable for Washington D.C. It's comfortable for Saudi Arabia who's being less less heard from now, now that Joe Biden has broken. It used to be that Saudi Arabia was a significant power broker. Um, the only person who brought any new perspective, uh, any new hope into the equation was uh, Donald Trump's son-in-law. What was his name? The guy who married, uh, the guy who married Donald Trump's daughter. I'm forgetting his name. <laughs> as soon as people lose the power of life and death over you, you, you don't care about their political opinions. Anymore. Anyway, Donald Trump's son-in-law, he really did uh, negotiate some new new settlement. He was he was making big waves out there and changing the status quo, which was interesting to see. But um, it doesn't it doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem now that anything will change under under Joe Biden. And I mean, the other person here is Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, obviously, nothing is going to change until Benjamin Netanyahu leaves power. So you know, 
Netanyahu's career is on its last legs. Nobody knows when he'll retire or when he'll go to prison. But anyway, look, you guys can watch Haaretz. Um, but yeah, sorry, as stated, I didn't want to get into a one hour uh, discourse on it, but sure. I, I suppose I'm uh, I suppose I'm denying you the opportunity to hear what I have to say about the Israel Palestine conflict. Mm -mm -mm. So someone yes, that's right. Uh Kushner was the guy's name. Yeah. Google it yourself, people. <laughs> you get you get a lot of great suggestions for things to, to Google from here. Uh, someone, uh, Suleiman Ali says he, he would never give to you charity unless it's really important. If I know exactly where the dollars are going. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that that kind of transparency keeps everyone involved. Honest. It keeps everyone involved. Sharp. Um, the people spending the money need to know what they're doing and why you need to have a very clear sense of purpose to be in the nonprofit sector. You need the discipline to, uh, to really serve a function with your, with your charity. Okay. Yeah, so someone comments that he's learning languages with the Michelle Thomas method. Yeah. And that it's a bad method. Well, you sound like you've seen my videos giving you suggestions on how to learn languages already. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so Edgy Intellect asks, I'll answer this briefly before I read you this, this passage here. Move on to the next, uh, and I presume final, but I was going to cover... On my list of things to do in this live stream, I was going to talk about Napoleon, uh, Napoleon's younger brother, and we we didn't get to it. So here you go. <laughs> we, <laughs> all right, we'll we'll see. We'll see how how, how long or uh, how short a, a shrift I give to Salist here. So, um, uh, quick question here: Do you think indigenous traditions can be preserved without the religion, guys? The year is two thousand twenty-one. Any tradition that exists in the world today will have been significantly uh, adapted and reinvented for the 21st century. Uh, look at Japan. You know, look at the reality of the Shinto religion in Japan. Look at animism in South Korea. It's partly traditional and it's partly modern. No, it's not possible for indigenous people to go back to human sacrifice. It's not possible for indigenous people to go back to slavery. And to my knowledge, nobody is even proposing that. Uh, there are some indigenous people who had, uh, you know, uh, ceremonies that involved torturing people, uh, torturing people to death sometimes, and sometimes just torturing people as a rite of initiation. Nobody is even discussing this. So no, I mean, in, in this sense, the idea of tradi tradition, the idea of cultural continuity, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. And, you know, keep in mind, uh, culture is something that we are either producing new here and now in every generation, or else it is something dead. It's something that exists in a museum behind a, you know, a glass case. So it's, it's one or the other. No, look, sorry, someone just mentioned uh, uh, Chinese legalism. What do you think? What do you think about the Kung Fu culture in China today? People learn Kung Fu in the Chinese army. You know, they learn it's, it, there, there's a modernized version of Kung Fu. And then there's an historical tradition of Kung Fu that you can read about and you can see in a museum. You can see it in movies. But, you know, I mean, this is the sort of thing that happens all around the world. But the question is, are they going to have their own culture? which is in large part going to be something they generate that's original and new now for the 21st century, but that's distinctively theirs and makes whatever use they can of the, those traditions. Traditions, they will very likely discover by reading the same books I, I read. If you want to know what traditional Cree scripture is like, let's put it that way, they're myths and legends, you got to read the same books I read. I mean, just imagine you go, go to the university library and get them off the shelf. That's you now you could take that and you can make you can make a new movie. You can make like a Disney style movie if you wanted to with, with uh, Creed. So many of them they'd make a better movie than Bambi or Dumbo. Honestly, I mean, you, you know, some of these legends you could you know breathe new life into them. You could make them uh, part of our culture today. It could be better than Batman. You know what I mean? You could make a new popular culture that's really. Uh, infused with and inspired by that indigenous tradition, but it will be in very large part, you know, an act of original creation. Um, to give you another example, what if you want to take Shakespeare to Japan? How do you make Shakespeare meaningful to a Japanese audience today? You may ostentatiously use some of the aesthetics of uh, medieval uh, Europe or Renaissance Europe. But I mean, you might go back earlier. I've seen versions of Hamlet that really put it in the dark ages instead. You know, they wanted to have that 
you know, 14th century aesthetic, even though the play isn't set in the 14th century. But, you know, you, you may, you may want to aesthetically evoke that, but in large part, you're going to, it's not just going to be a translation. It's going to be an adaptation and a reinvention to say, we're taking Hamlet and we're going to, we're going to do something with it that means something to Japanese people today. So that's, that's the kind of thing that's, that would happen if it's going to happen with and for, you know, indigenous people in, in Canada or in, uh, the, you know, the deserts of the United States or something, you know, it's ridiculous to think that these people want to live in a museum or they want to live their lives in a backward looking way. Indigenous people are people, you know, this comes up all the time, you know, they, they also want to cut down the forests and make money out of the wood. And they, you know, they have the same desires and needs that everyone else has. It's not that they want to live in a forest forever just because they're indigenous and never forget. I mean, the indigenous people of Germany are German. The indigenous people of France are French. Indigenousness is not unique to minority or conquered or oppressed traditions. And, you know, if you ask, where is German culture today? Well, in some ways it's everywhere and in some ways it's nowhere. Um, you know, most of the storybooks we have are actually French in origin for children. Even the ones that we think are German because they were written down by the Brothers Grimm. But you do have this tradition. Let's just hyphenated and say you have a French and German tradition of, of, of children's stories. And, you know, like when we think of Cinderella, where does Cinderella take place? The little Red Riding Hood, where does it take place? It's some idea of the European past. So that is French culture and that is German culture. As I say, actually, most of those stories are more French than German, but some of them are German. Um, uh, anyway, sorry, I could, uh, Rapunzel, story of Rapunzel. Um, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, at dinner. where does that take place? And what does it mean today? I mean, can you take Rapunzel and make it more meaningful than Batman or Mickey Mouse or Miss Piggy? And if you can't, get off the microphone or get out of Hollywood or, you know, quit and find each other. You know, that's, that's the kind of challenge. So I'm just saying, indigenous people are people. Indigenous culture is culture. It's not a different challenge. It's the same challenge. Um, I, I got some Irish viewers. You want to make Traditional Irish culture matter, you know, huge, you can, you can, you can get into the, you know, the, 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 you know, the epic poetry of Ireland written in Ogham. Uh, not really. It's kind of an inside joke with linguists, but anyway, they used to write they had this writing system called Ogham, which they used for uh, gravestones. But anyway, they didn't actually write literature. In it. But anyway, this, you know, you have this pre-modern, you know, tradition. Okay. You, you want that to mean something today. you got to make it meaningful to people. It's, it's a big challenge. Now, if you ask me, am I, am I optimistic about that? No, I, I'm not. It's I, I'm from my perspective, I'm living in a very saddening period of cultural stagnation. And I, what am I supposed to give my own daughter to read? You know, what video game am I, am I supposed to give my own daughter to play? You guys know, I tried to create my own holiday out of, out of Sockmas, but I think there's very little that's meaningful that you can give children. And that's, uh, it's not easy for me to give something meaningful to, uh, to my audience as adults. Okay, guys. So we did not get to Napoleon today. So I get Napoleon can be topic number one for next week. I wanted to give you guys a reading from an author that I had only heard of quite recently, Salust, S-A-L-L-U-S-T. And I'm going to read you a passage here from Salust. Um, so look, Salist was incredibly influential and incredibly important 200 years ago, probably still 150 years ago or something like that. When exactly his fame started to, pardon me, started to fade, I don't know. But I'm going to read you. Anyway, I think you will see right away. Uh, Salist is both of political and philosophical interest, and he writes in very blunt, very simple Latin. So he was also one of the texts that was given to beginners in the language, many quotations from Salus and so on. So apparently he was easier to read than Cicero, but in many ways his work is kind of linked to Cicero. So it might have prepared people to go on and read Cicero. And Cicero was idealized as the perfect Latin author, the perfect stylist who everyone should imitate in their own, in their own writing and in their own way of thinking too. Uh, Cicero was that kind of ideal. So anyway, but this is Sallust who was alive at the same time. And he was in many ways actually an enemy of or a political opponent of Cicero's. Okay, so I begin my quotation. Quote, I say this because just as the human race is composed of body and soul, so all of our accomplishments and pursuits follow either our physical or spiritual nature. 
And so it is that outstanding beauty, great wealth, even physical strength and other similar things quickly pass away. But the extraordinary deeds of intellectual talent are, just like the soul, immortal. Simply put, just as there is a beginning, so there is an end to the benefits of body and fortune. All that is born dies, all that grows, grows old. But the soul is incorruptible, eternal, and the director of the human race. It guides and has power over all things, and is not itself controlled. All the more surprising, then, is the depravity of those who are devoted to bodily pleasures and pass their lives in luxury and idleness, but allow their intellectual talent, which is the best and most noble part of human nature, to grow torpid with neglect and indolence, especially when the rational soul has so many different ways to attain the heights of glory. Goes on. He is really not happy with what, uh, what Rome has become uh, in his own generation. But of all the paths to glory, it seems to me that at the present time, political office and military power, indeed all public service, is utterly undesirable, since the honor of public office is not granted for virtuous action, and those who use fraud to enjoy these offices are not secure or more honorable because of it. This is because the use of force to rule over one's country and subjects, even though you could and might correct abuses, is still a risky thing especially when every change of circumstances brings with it slaughter, exile, and other acts of hostility. So he's saying here somewhat indirectly, every time there's an election or every time there's a change of circumstances uh, in Rome, there is slaughter, exile, and, uh, and other acts of hostility. Um, on the other hand, it is the height of madness to labor in vain and to acquire from one's efforts nothing but exhaustion and hatred. Unless, of course, one is possessed by some dishonorable and dangerous desire to sacrifice one's self-respect and freedom to the powerful interests of the few. So again, this is interesting because Sallust describes Catiline's rebellion or Catiline's conspiracy as the poor rebelling against the rule of the few and the few means the Senate the Senate, which is comprised of the, the rich ruling class of Rome, that he has just been complaining, care nothing about developing their intellectual talents. You'll see he gets he gets a little bit uh, more vicious here in complaining about his, his uh, other members of his generation in Rome. But there are other activities that employ one's innate intellectual abilities, and preeminent among these is the reporting of historical events. I think I will be silent about its value because others have written of that, and because I do not want anyone to think that, out of vanity, I am extolling and praising my own endeavor, which is, of course, exactly what he is doing. Um, I also believe that, although my work is difficult and useful, there will still be those who will stigmatize it with the name of idleness, because I have decided not to participate in politics. These are the men who think that the most important activity is to court and greet the people and to seek influence through dinner parties. He really hates this. Throughout his writing, Salas, he hates these people who spend all their time going to dinner parties, flattering uh, one another, drinking alcohol, and sleeping with prostitutes. Um, here, prostitutes don't come up in this passage, but this is this is his percent of his perception of the life of the uh, the political elite in Rome. And uh, again, sorry, interesting question: whose perspective of this kind could we read today? Um, I do not know about the private life of Donald Trump or the private life of Joe Biden or Bill Clinton, but uh, actually the complaint here about, uh, uh, certainly we know that about JFK. JFK had problems with drugs and alcohol and dinner parties and prostitutes. Yeah, JF, we, we, we know, you know, the archives are kind of open on that. So some of what Salas is saying here was certainly true, but some people in the political elite, I don't know if you can believe everything that is said today about Bill Clinton, but Bill Clinton might be pretty close to the, the bottom of the barrel uh, on the list of most, most immoral uh, American presidents in that sense. I realize he is not remembered that way today, but anyway, uh, I continue. <laughs> so anyway, um, but I asked them to reconsider the circumstances in which I attained political office, the kind of men who could not achieve the same thing, and the class of men who entered the Senate afterwards. If they do, then I am sure that they will conclude that I changed my mind for good reason, not out of idleness, and that the outcome of my retirement will benefit the state more than the busy participation of others will. The following supports my claim. 
I have often heard that in the past, Maximus Scipio, so Scipio is how we pronounce the English, but obviously this is Scipio, if you know, the letter C was never pronounced as a soft C. In Asian language. Anyway, so this is Scipio Africanus, famous person. Um, and other eminent men of our state used to say that their soul was most irresistibly fired to accomplish acts out of manly virtue when they gazed upon the wax images of their ancestors. To be sure, it was not the wax or the image that had such power in itself, but the memory of things done that nourished the flame in the breast of extraordinary men. And that flame did not die down until their manly virtue had equaled that fame and glory. But who is there today with our contemporary morals? Pardon me. But who is there today with our contemporary morals that would rather compete with his ancestors in moral fiber and hard work than in wealth and ostentatious consumption? Even the so-called new men who before with their virtuous actions used to surpass the old aristocracy now use underhanded fraud and open violence in their struggle for military power and, and to obtain uh, political offices rather than decent moral practices. It is as if the praetorship and the consulship and all other offices of this kind were in themselves noble and magnificent things and not things whose value corresponded to the virtue of those who held them. But I have digressed too far and freely in expressing my contempt and disgust for our political morality. I now return to our subject. <laughs> Salist on the political reality, uh, pardon me, on the, the political reality and the political morality of his times.